Bienvenidos and welcome to the Injury Prone Podcast. This is your co-host Jorge Martin and hey to my side, el doctor, Dr. Edwin Porras, mi amigo, ¿cómo estamos? It's uh, Friday afternoon, week two. Friday afternoon, Friday e evening, Jorge, we can have a whole <laughs> debate. Do evenings yeah. start? So for you, it's afternoon. For me, it's 5 p.m. You're on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. So it's afternoon for you, but when does evening start? Does evening start at 5 p.m., 5.30? What is the official word on evening versus afternoon? And if oh. and if anybody knows, uh, leave a comment and, and leave leave a comment about what time formally afternoon shifts to evening. Because I kind of want to know. Well, well, to, uh, you know what? Did you ever have that conversation with your parents? You know, when does when you say when I this when as noches? So ah, <laughs> uh, that's that's a classic conversation. Uh, that's the conversation that piggybacks the saluda cabron. When I, when you get in trouble, you you walk in, you don't say anything. You're like 12 years old. You don't you don't don't know any of the adults in the room. And they want you to give like a formal greeting to everybody. I think I think I don't know if that's universal cross cultures. That's definitely a Latin culture thing. It's like it, you could have no no you could not know this person you know at all. You have no idea who they are. You have no idea why they're in your house. You're just trying to come home and go to your room. But if you don't say hi, oh, my God, it, it's the end of the world. Um, yeah, man, you just God, you give me every week. You give me flashbacks. Sometimes they're good flashbacks. Sometimes they're bad flashbacks. <laughs> I got one more for you. This was this was a fa famous one in my house. You know, whenever you would uh, say, your, you know, put put yourself into a, a group with, you know, kind of like into a lineup with other people. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like uh, instead of saying, you know, Edwin and I, I I'd say I, you know, me and Edwin and my mom, you know, if I would say, if I would put myself first, my mom or my or, or pop would say, el burro primero, you know, and just <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like oh that. man. Oh man. So, okay. All right. So we got, a, we're off to a great start. Well, you know what? I, I think, I think people are already having a happy hour in your neck of the woods. So I think, it's, I, th I think it's evening. It's even, heck, you know what, mm -hmm. out here in California, people are already doing happy hour anyway. So uh, <laughs> hey, it's, it's when I started this, it's when I started this. So it's when I started this of week two. So, uh, you know, well, first off, I want to make sure, Hey, you know what, everybody, I'm going to, I'm going to give, I'm going to give Edwin the floor right now. You guys want a P want to be in the Patreon, in the injury prone Patreon. Come on. Uh, mi amigo, díganos. Yes. So the injury from Patreon is basically everything that every mention that I've ever gotten in the last five years, all the questions, the the start sit decisions, the should I trade for, should I trade, you know, should I trade away? Should I cut? Should I stash? What do I do with this guy? You know, what is your recommendation? What is your projected time frame? What is the timetable that we're looking at? Like, what can we expect from a performance perspective? All of that, including, including the season long playbook, which is every position and every major injury you're going to get how long they're usually out what percentage of time most you know players miss so in other words 10 percent of the time they miss zero games 90 percent of the time they miss two games right you're going to get that you're going to get how volatile they are so you get some some mathematical calculations that are explained in that guide to you know they're this percent volatile or you know i know a lot of people want to quantify how risky is this decision i tried to do that in this guide. i tried to make it give you an answer to how risky starting a guy versus sitting a guy is you get how many fantasy points per game that position averages when they come back from the injury you get all of that plus a q a plus uh basically the ability to ask me questions all throughout the week you you get this the recommendation so all the transactions that i could potentially recommend trade away target aggressively all that kind of stuff again all of that in the patreon i really want to build a community of people who are reasonable and you know want to have a smart articulate conversation beyond the twitter character limits and it's it's not free but i have to say you know i'm, I'm putting the time and the effort I've, and i put a lot of time and energy and effort i feel like nine bucks a month Jorge, I feel like that's more than reasonable to ask. I understand that that's a lot of times that's not possible for people. Um, but if you can jump in there, nine dollars a month, that's two Starbucks drinks or one Starbucks drink, depending on how big you're, you how big you go with your order. So that's I just wanted to give that a plug. I wanted to throw that in there. Um, Jorge's in there. We're going to start rolling on those. The community slowly growing um, and we're going to start getting some good conversations in there. You're also going to get um priority with questions and we're actually going to use one of the patreon questions to answer uh that has to do with cooper cup later on so that's enough of that let's get started no definitely definitely you want to get in there uh just i mean heck you know what i feel i I feel lucky just, you know, having having this one on one with you once a week and, uh, you know, everybody, come on, let's get in, get into that community, grow that community, because you know what you, you follow 20,000 people follow Edwin. 
So I, you know, there are a reason why these people to get that one on one information. Hey, it's priceless. It's priceless. Come on. You know, it, 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 it costs, it costs more to go to McDonald's now. So, you know, just, uh, let, let's, let's get in there. And so also make sure, you know, Hey, we're almost at a hundred followers on, on hundred subscribers on YouTube. Give us that follow, por favor, come on, get in there. You're getting this every week, every week. You're going to get that notification set up. We see you all watching. We know that more than hundred people are, are watching this. So some of the, some of our shows have gotten really, really big views. So uh, thank you for joining us, but yes, hit that subscribe button. It helps us keep growing. So, uh, so Edwin, we're going to start with the, the story of the week and uh, gosh, the guy, the guy made it to four plays and, uh, and then, it just you know blew out the Achilles. So Aaron Rodgers had his uh, ACL surgery. Uh, where, I'm sorry, ACL Achilles surgery. Where uh, front with Dr. Neil Elatrash out, out here in my backyard, my former colleague at the at the Dodgers. So he's still the f team surgeon for the Dodgers and the Lakers. So uh, to have uh, coincidentally, he also performed the Cam Akers surgery. So, you know, which got him back five, five and a half months. I don't, I don't think we're expecting anything like that, but a guy to have this at 40 years, almost 40 years old. I mean, can you, can you describe what the rehab is looking like ahead for him? Yeah. So it's not going to be easy. Right. Um, but we do know that Dr. Neil Alatrash did the repair. We assume it's called uh, an, a mini open repair. When you have a mini open repair, really the biggest difference is that you're able to start weight bearing. So putting weight through that foot, starting rehab a lot more, a lot, a lot more quickly as you hear my dog whining and, and scratching. I don't know why. Sorry about that. Uh, but you have a much, you begin rehab a lot more quickly, right? The other uh, component you have to look at it is he is, like you said, almost 40 years old for Cam Akers. He was, you know, 21, 22 years old, that tissue viability, that, that tissue health, that tendon health is a lot more, uh, positive at that point. Not to say that somebody 40 years old is decrepit and falling apart, especially him, right? He's, he's still an elite level athlete, but your tissue just doesn't respond as quickly. But I will say five months is possible for Aaron Rodgers. It is on the table. I don't want to say it's going to, it's the most likely scenario. I don't want to say that it's, you know, going to happen slam dunk five months though, for a quarterback, because he's not moving in the pocket. He doesn't depend as, you know, as much or at all on explosiveness on quick change of direction or anything like that. Five months is possible. Don't rule it out, but that would really mean like the jets would have to be like, Super Bowl bound yeah. for him to really come back. That's the problem. So he said today on Pat McAfee, don't rule out a, a return in 2023. I would be skeptical of that. I, I don't really think that's going to happen. I don't think that would be the case. Um, but again, it is plausible. So we just wanted to point out, yeah, Aaron Rodgers done for the season on the IR. So we just wanted to get that one out of the way so that people don't question why we didn't talk about it. Yeah, and I think your dog uh, didn't didn't you say that your dog had uh, Aaron Rodgers in Superflex League, and that's uh, that's why you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. My dog had Aaron Rodgers in the Superflex League, and so uh, she's not very happy that I'm talking about it again. She's still upset. She hasn't gotten over it. She's climbing all over my wife right now. So my wife's trying to t to take care of the dog. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> um, well, you know what? It, it's yeah, it's definitely a tough one, and um, love, hell of a rehab. But you know what? He got one of the best doctors in the in in the country to take care of that. That surgery and uh you know well i almost have it we're gonna follow it I, he, he i don't think he's done either um don't think he's done so next up i want to go to the running backs so let, let's go to the running backs a lot of intrigue especially starting again in my backyard uh, with Austin Eckler, he missed three days of practice this week with that with that ankle with they haven't it hasn't been described officially as a high ankle sprain uh, but I, it's not looking good, me amigo. No, it is not looking good. For they've already listed him as doubtful. He didn't practice all week. That's not really great. Um, we kind of got the sense this was going to be the case. There is some video showing that it could have been a high ankle. It's hard to really say. I don't want to say that I know for a fact that that's what it, that's what it was. But sort of the way that he landed and the angles that we had available, it looked like it very much, it very well could have been a high ankle sprain. So what are we looking at? If it is a high ankle sprain, the mode, otherwise known as the most frequent amount of time that guys miss since 2016 running backs is it's, it's actually, there are two modes. So it's bimodal is what you call that. They miss zero games more, mo, you know, frequently or most frequently, or they miss three games most frequently. So he might fall into that bucket of missing three games. If this is a high ankle sprain, don't hit the panic button. Don't freak out because there's still a chance. This could be a lateral ankle sprain. 
with a lateral ankle sprain, it's very, very rare that guys miss more than one week and he could return in week three. What I would say is plan for somewhere between missing Austin Eckler for about two weeks, three weeks. I don't think at this point right now that we know of, I don't think it's going to be a long-term issue. Um, and let's talk about a little bit. I think I want to hear your thoughts on Josh Kelly, because I think we disagree a little bit on this and, and I tweeted about it, but you were telling me before we hit record your thoughts on Josh Kelly and whether he's a must start in, in most leagues. So what do you think of that? What do you got on that in week two for Josh Kelly? Well, compadre, uh, I wish I could say good things because I, I I loved what Joshua Kelly did last week. I thought it was fantastic. I, me being a UCLA fan, uh, I watched him. I watched him play in his college years. Rooted for him for the with the Chargers. It looked like a breakout game. It it definitely looks like he's going to get the opportunity. But you know what? I put on out there on the, the Yahoo roundtable yesterday that I'm sitting Joshua Kelly. And the reason why I'm sitting Joshua Kelly, it's it, it's it's not opportunity. It's the fact that he's going up against Stonewall this week. The front seven for the Tennessee Titans is one of the best, if not the best, in the NFL. They were number one in rushing defense last year, the, allowed the fewest r- rushing yards allowed. And, uh, you know, it's it's the same unit again. And I, I think what's going to happen is they're going to put the ball into Justin Herbert's hand because on the flip side, they're the worst pass defense last year. And you know what? They just had uh, Chris Olave, Rashid Shaheed, and Michael Thomas just go all over them uh, last week. And I think now you got Justin Herbert with 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 a healthy Keenan Allen, Mike Williams. Uh, you know everything looks good with him. I mean, we we don't have him on the list to talk about today, but um, he did take a hell of a hit last week. So I, and those guys, I, I would have liked. Eckler to be a part of that passing game, but I'm really, I'm really think it's going to be wheels up on, on Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, and maybe a breakout game for Quentin Johnston or Joshua Palmer. I think just that it's going to be all passing all the time. I think it could be 40 plus pass attempts and the, the chargers winning big. I think it actually could be, I don't think we disagree. I actually think that both things can actually be true. And maybe that does mean that ultimately we disagree. We'll let the listener decide what they want to do. Ultimately, we have Elijah Dotson, who's a rookie. He's 5'9 and 200 pounds. He wears number 42. You know he can't be successful. He wears number 42. Uh, that's obvious. That's obvious. A direct correlation there. And then Isaiah Spiller, who somehow is listed fourth on the depth chart. So after coming in and having a year on the rookie, Elijah Dotson, who wears number 42, Isaiah Spiller's uh, number four on the depth chart. So you have Josh Kelly, Elijah Dotson, who wears number 42, and Isaiah Spiller, who couldn't beat out a rookie, is fourth on the depth chart. There's no other place, Jorge. They can't pass the ball every every down. There's no other place that ball can go. You also have to consider if they are airing the ball out, if the Titans can't match points, which I don't think the Titans can match points, what are they going to do when they're trying to ice the game away? Hand off right, hand off left, hand off right. Turn over Ryan Tannehill again, get the ball at the five, hand off left, Josh Kelly touchdown. I think that there's enough room for the passing game to be successful and be a funnel the way that you're talking about and for Josh Kelly to still pay off considering you got him on waivers for, I don't know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, especially if you only, if you went like an anchor RB strategy, I don't, I just don't know how you don't start Josh Kelly. If you got him on waivers, right? Like if you went anchor RB with Austin Eckler and you've got, who's your second running back, like God forbid, Dios mio, if you did J.K. Dobbins as your second running back, you are absolutely starting Josh Kelly, right? Like there's no way around it to me. Obviously, if you're uh, really lucky and you have a, a solid roster and, and, and a backup plan from that, then that's one thing. But I think that you have to really assess your situation. And, and again, listener, you decide, should I start Josh Kelly? Should I not? But I do think that there there is room for both things to exist here with the Chargers. Okay, I, 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 we're going to see how it, how it plays out, how it plays out. But you're right. It's, you know, it even the running back market right now, it's looking like 145 in the morning at the club. You know, it's late. It's late and it's not looking good. So um, let's go over to Green Bay. We all saw the video of Aaron uh, Aaron Jones grabbing his ham, his left hamstring as he was scoring that long touchdown. He came out of the game. They, they were icing that game away, but it's you know the the practice participation with the practice participation this week what how's he trending yeah so aaron jones has not practiced um you have to remember aaron jones is 29 right 28 or 29 and that matters because the older you are the harder it is for you to get over this hamstring strain he actually this is a recurrence for aaron jones he had a hamstring strain in 2019 that didn't really stop him when he was much younger than he is now Uh, he's not decrepit but again when you're in the NFL, 28-29 is, is you're really getting over the hill there, especially at the running back position. Uh, it takes longer for your tissues to heal. 
it just sort of is what it is, unfortunately. So he hasn't practiced all week that we know of. We haven't gotten practice reports back for this hamstring stuff that he's dealing with. But, you know, I, it doesn't really doesn't look like it's trending in the right direction. And I'm looking at I pulled up the practice reports right now. He was a DMP. They're calling him questionable. Is he a guy that can come back and play without any practices? Probably. But should I expect it? I don't necessarily expect it. Running backs on average since 2018 have missed one game, a little over one game with a hamstring strain. Uh, so I would anticipate that he's back next week unless, again, you're, you're going to talk a little bit. I know you have a question about like conservative versus not. But as of now, there's a chance that we see Aaron Jones back week three. But I wouldn't anticipate he's in the lineup for week two. And, you know, speaking of conservative, I mean, I've heard from I've heard on multiple podcasts that the Green Bay Packers are a little bit more conservative when it comes to their uh, in, the injuries and their training staff, you know, maybe, maybe holding guys out an extra game uh, to make sure 100 percent that they're fine with this being a soft tissue injury. I mean, where kind of like what's what's your stance on teams being and, you know, do you agree on the Packers and uh, and teams being conservative versus aggressive? I think generally speaking, most teams lean aggressive and it's all relative to the conversation because when you have to get a guy back in, in, in one week, you'd be surprised how much guys play through. I think if, if we really knew and if the general public really knew how much dudes are actually playing through, then athletic trainers and PTs in the NFL would get a 2x, 3x salary bump. Uh, that's really the honest truth. So are the Packers more conservative than other teams? When I stop and think about it, I don't have any data to back it up but it does kind of seem like they are they took a long time with Devontae adams turf toe in 2019 that's one one particular thing that's that stands out to me um they held him out a couple practices in 2020 as well with the calf and and i remember seeing reports saying that he could actually play if he had to so they are a little bit more conservative i do think that's the for me philosophically as a physical therapist as a sports pt i actually do think that's probably the right move uh, but again it's really hard to justify that when there are so many hands in the pot when you have the gm the assistant gm the coach right the the owner you have you know the head athletic trainer you have the the staff pt you have snc right there are so many hands in the pot that it's hard to really say how you know for one decision maker for one person to, to be the decision maker that's just not realistic so i think at worst we see aaron jones miss two weeks but i do think that he has a chance for next week okay and and him if he miss, if he does end up missing, AJ Dillon is wheels up because the the Falcons are not a good run run defense, and so that one that one I I, I am going to go for the uh, backup on that one. Uh, so we're pouring one out for J.K. Dobbins. I mean, just horrible luck. Twenty twenty one gets the preseason torn ACL, and then he you know first game out after he scores a touchdown, tears his Achilles. I, you know, for running, I mean, we, again, we saw uh, Cam Akers come back, but really, I mean, how hard is this coming on the heel, um, practically on the heels of, of becoming healthy from the torn ACL? Yeah, it's just, you're sick for this guy. Um, this is super unfortunate. Who knows what the deal is? Who knows why? You know, you could ask a hundred questions. Is, is it the workloads? Is it him trying to come back last year? Um, is it the knee that was just never came back and there was stress on, on tendons down the stream? We don't know. We'll never know. The, that's the unfortunate reality. I do think that it's an uphill battle for J.K. Dobbins. Um, that's really all you need to know. It's, it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, there's a very low chance that he makes it back in 2023. I think 2024 should be the target for him. Uh, and I don't know what to do with his backfield at this point, un unfortunately. I mean, Gus Edwards, probably the, the closest thing you have to, to a bell cow in this backfield. I don't know what you think. I I put more money on Gus Edwards in in Fab this week than than Jake than Justice Hill. I just I think more of the track record. He's the bigger back, more north south guy. He's he's kind of like that banger that you, that uh, John Harbaugh likes. And I mean he's got more of a track record with the team. So and plus he did better. I mean he thirty two yards on eight carries where Justice Hill got nine carries on eight nine nine rushing yards on eight carries. So. Uh, but uh, I'm going to monitor this because they also have Melvin Gordon in there and there's still guys looming out there. Leonard Fournette, Kareem Hunt, guys like that, that are still, that, that are still out there that could be, or you know what, do they, do they trade for Jonathan Taylor? Ooh. I think you put that on you, but that would be sexy. <laughs> that would be sexy. That would so, be nice. Oh man. Well, uh, I think, I think it's time now to go to the wide receivers and Puka Nakua, 
the breakout sensation from week one. A lot of people <laughs> spend a lot of fab money on him and then comes up on the practice report with an oblique. What's kind of your prognosis? Not surprising. I think an oblique can be a couple of different things. Uh, it could be what Jalen Waddle is dealing with, or it can be from a contact thing. Uh, we assume that, that the oblique strain is from uh, sort of your, your obliques run this way, this way you have obliques. They're essentially your, your ab muscles and your muscles that rub on your, or run along your ribs. If you're ripping and rotating a lot, which he was with a 40% freaking target share or something crazy, um, that's going to happen when you're a rookie and you're not used to playing at that speed, at that intensity for that long. That's going to happen. This is unsurprising. So Sean McVay did say, come out and say that they expect him to play. I don't necessarily think that, that that's unreasonable. Uh, he's slightly more volatile, maybe like minimal to moderately more volatile. But if you spent, if you blew your fab on Puka Nakua, I mean, you've got to start him this week. You probably have to start him. Uh, so just throw him out there. And I do think that he can still be productive. Just understand that there is some slight volatility for a re-injury risk. And I, and I do like him this week because uh, the Rams are going to have to throw the ball because the 49ers are going to score some points this week. And I think the, and the, and when I was talking about Tennessee, the 49ers are right there with the, uh, with the Titans as the best run defense in the league. So I don't think I, I, it's going to be hard for Kyron Williams and Cam Akers to get loose this week. So the Rams are going to have to pass the ball. So uh, wheels up Puka, you know, and, and uh, two, two at one, I'm not giving up on Van Jefferson just yet. So uh, let's, let's, let's look at that one. Uh, now, Deontay Johnson. So it's sounding like a bad hamstring. Mike Tomlin said multiple weeks. Uh, he didn't go on IR like like Cooper Cup. Is that encouraging? So, did I'm sorry. So, in terms of Deontay Johnson, this has been sort of a I don't want to call it a frustration. It's probably a little dramatic. Uh, but the reports on him came from from Gary du Dulac, I think is how you say his last name, is that the recovery will be, quote, up to four weeks. When you, I hear that, I automatically think of the statistic that I looked that's in the season long playbook. Again, you can join on the Patreon and it's right there for you. Since 2018, wide receivers of this profile, they miss more than three games, three or I'll say it this way, three or more games. They miss three or more games just 11 percent of the time. They miss no time, 52% of the 52% of the time, and they miss one game 21% of the time. Right. At worst, it seems like Deontay Johnson will miss, maybe he'll miss three games. But really, Deontay Johnson is the walking. I said this on Twitter. He's a walking Kevin Nash gif. You know, the, the gif where he's Kevin Nash gets rolled to the ring. He's got a blanket with a wheelchair, right? He's got his leg up and then he pulls the pulls the blanket off and he stands up. That is Deontay Johnson. That has been Deontay Johnson's career. So I'm not saying that he's not injured. I'm not saying that he's faking it. I'm saying that he can be a little dramatic sometimes. I don't think that's unreasonable to say. So the up to four weeks is like, yes, it could it go four weeks. Yes, it could. But I just went through this with even when Adam Schefter was saying that Jerry Judy could be out six, six to eight weeks. I came out on Twitter. I said, I, I don't think that's the case. And lo and behold, we have Jerry Judy coming back next week after I think it was three weeks. Right. So, um, Hold your breath. You can go ahead and hold your breath on Deontay Johnson. Don't freak out. Don't drop him. I've gotten a lot of people on Twitter saying that they dropped him. Don't drop Deontay Johnson. Keep him on your keep keep him on your bench. At worst, I think we see him come back week five. I do think that like a week three, week four return though is realistic. Yeah, there are people, me included. Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of Deontay Johnson. I also have some J Jameson Williams where I knew I was going to have have to sit him for six weeks and going to see how long. Yeah, do not drop Deontay Johnson. Just do not de drop Deontay Johnson. This week, it, it could mean big big things for uh, Pat Fryermuth, who I just traded to you in, in your injury in the injury prone league, and uh, and also, but especially for George Pickens. So, uh, so big things coming for for those guys. Um, you know, we talked about the Packers earlier. Christian Watson is the you know is is looks like he's training toward. Does, does it look like he's training toward missing another week? Yeah, it looks like Christian Watson is turning towards missing another week. Looking at the practice reports again, it does look like he he didn't practice today. But again, they're calling him questionable. I don't necessarily expect Christian Watson to go this week, but I do think that next week, uh, especially... Oh, let me correct myself, Jorge. He was a limited participant this week. Or I mean today. Christian Watson was Ooh. limited. So I will say, if he comes back this week, if he plays this week, he is highly volatile. I think in most circumstances, unless you got extremely unlucky and you hit the lottery, 
and you have Cooper Cup, Deontay Johnson, and Christian Watson, and Jerry Judy, you're probably having to start Christian Watson and Jerry Judy, both of them. If you have the luxury and the availability, if Christian Watson is active, I am not putting him out there. Going two DNPs followed by an LP and then going out to be the number one wide receiver in an NFL game is extremely risky because there's already a 34% recurrence rate. We do not want him in our lineup if there's a recurrence. I would shy away from him in DFS specifically. And in most leagues, even if he's active, I probably would not start. Oh, and I've got so much Christian Watson. And and, and it's it's 2 a.m. at the bar when, it, you know, on, on who I have at the bench. So not looking pretty, not looking pretty. But uh, yeah, I, I but you're right. It, it, and especially it being the first game of the season, the first game that he's played in almost 10 months. So hard to hard to expect to put him out there for like like that. Uh, last wide receiver, DeAndre Hopkins has been has you know, popped up on their injury report this week. What uh, he's he, he, you know, not much, not much for the Titans. Yeah. So DeAndre Hopkins, this has been a little bit uh, interesting to deal with because he's a guy that doesn't really practice like genuinely legitimately if you have copies of the injury report from past years he is literally a dmp dmp or lp 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 across the board he almost never practices on wednesdays and it's he's pretty notorious for just not liking practice which is fine whatever it is what it is so when he actually had an injury and there's a video of it where he lands and it looks like he has some an eversion type injury which would consider be classified technically for our purposes as like a high ankle sprain it's concerning so he hasn't practiced all week. You're going to really want to watch the practice reports or the, the final, uh, you know, 90 minutes before kickoff, the actives and actives for this one. But even if he's active, it's really hard to, to throw him out there because that injury did look legitimately serious. I think that if he's your wide receiver three, four, maybe you can, you know, wide receiver three flex, maybe you you're fine with it. Uh, but, you know, in most circumstances, I'm probably not going to touch DeAndre Hopkins and DFS this week. And I might even go out on a limb and say, you know, Chica Conquo, Traylon Burks, they could have an uptick because, you're, like you said, they're going to be chasing points most of uh, the game against the Chargers. So uh, we'll see what we'll see what we'll see what happens. Stay tuned to the Patreon on this one. Stay tuned to Twitter on this one. I'll continue to give updates. I I almost I almost missed one guy. You touched on him earlier, Jerry Judy, the last of the wide receivers that we're going to talk about. Yeah, Jerry Judy, opposite boat as Christian Watson. The Broncos were pretty smart with this, in my opinion, that he was almost going to go. And I think a lot of guys on a lot of teams may have played last week. He would have been limited and he wasn't. So that's really good. Uh, that means that they waited an extra week. I, even though he's still at risk for a re-injury jumping into a game, I don't think he's at, at as much risk as Christian Watson if he is active. So Jerry Judy, I'm putting him in most lineups. Uh, I, I think so. And I've, wherever I, I know, I'm with you and wherever I have him, it, you know, they, they need that. There were a lot of people talking about Marvin Mims having a breakout game. He saw eight snaps last week. So they want Jerry Judy to come back and be a part of this offense. I think that, I think it's, it's going to be, uh, yeah, I, I'm definitely looking to start him. Okay. We're going to close out with the tight ends. So Travis Kelsey, other than not getting, you know, giving his number to Taylor Swift, uh, you know, he, he, you know, things are, things may be trending up in other directions, right? Andy Reid said that that Travis Kelsey is going to be out there. Usually we trust Andy Reid. Um, we do want to take some caution, I guess. But man, you got to get you got to get Travis Kelsey. If Travis Kelsey's active, you're going to play him. Uh, I think you might see some reduction in the amount of time that he stays in line and blocks. You, you'll probably see some some snaps. They'll sort of sway the way that they really use him. I think he'll be out there for passing downs. Uh, I don't know if they'll use him as much for blocking this week. He might be slightly limited. He might be at like 85%, but I'll take 85% Travis Kelsey over most of the guys that we just talked about in reality, right? So uh, Travis Kelsey's out there. That's really the short of it. Start him. Yeah, 85% uh, Travis Kelsey. I take that over 99% <laughs> of, of, of any tight ends, 100% tight ends in, in a lot of cases. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're, you're playing him. I'm not seeing I'm, – I'm not expecting him to block at all, not expecting any blocking at all. Another guy who doesn't – is not expected to block at all, Mark Andrews. He kind of came up as a surprise, uh, you know, inactive last week, uh, you know, there's the talk of him coming back this week. I mean, it, it, your, your thoughts. So the Ravens are another one of those teams that are, when you talk about conservative versus aggressive, they tend to lean on the conservative side uh, because they do let guys go limited practice, LP, 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 and then they actually will sit them. 
Whereas most teams, a lot of teams, if a guy goes LPLPLP, it's a slam dunk that they're going to play. Tra- uh, Mark Andrews last week, he was limited all week and, and didn't, end, didn't end up playing. Uh, came out on Saturday night, Ian Rappaport even said it was surprising. Most people were surprised. I was surprised. So I owe everybody an apology. I was wrong on that. I, I did mention, you know, you could tell I actually went back. I don't ever do this. And when I mean never, I never do this because I hate the sound of my own voice. I went back and listened to what I said. And I looked at my body language and I and I and I heard the what I was saying. And I could tell that I was uncomfortable giving the recommendation, uh, but but I didn't really have anything definitive. And I said, I don't have anything definitive to tell you that this is going to be a problem. And it ended up being a problem. So it was a really weird situation. Uh, uh, I'll watch the film, as they say, I'll get better. But Mark Andrews was a full participant in practice on Friday, which is a really good sign. Obviously, after last week, we can't see anything to slam dunk. So make sure, again, you're checking the inactives, the actives. Make sure you're checking in on the Patreon. Uh, and uh, I do think that he's going to go this week. And last, I, I don't want to get to it because we're, we're running over on time. But I do want to say, I like Zay Flowers. Zay Flowers seems like a really good player. Zay Flowers was incredible for a rookie debut. Zay Flowers was a fun player to watch. Zay Flowers is probably a really, really good person. <laughs> Zay Flowers is probably not going to get the target share that he saw in week one ever again this this year, maybe week nine, 10. But I think that there's a lot of manufactured inflated production that we saw out of Zay Flowers. You have Rashad Bateman, who's still coming back. And I said this on Twitter, right? He mm. got he ran a route on 48 percent of snaps uh, last year, even though he was even limited last year. But even compared to last year. Uh, he that is that was a 58 percent mark. So he ran around on 58 percent of routes in 2022. Week one was just 48 uh, percent. Don't forget Rashad Bateman's coming back from that list, Frank, still. So I think this offense is going to actually look totally different in week five, you know, in, in week three and week four than it did in week one. So that's just something for you guys to, to pay attention to. I'm def I'm with I'm 100 percent with you on Zay Flowers and but yeah you're right Mark Andrews is the guy when it comes to this offense he's there Travis Kelsey so he's he's the number one guy one guy that that we had high hopes for was Darren Waller and everything looked good until last week leading up to leading up, you know the practice reports started looking not the and the injury reports weren't weren't coming back very positive uh, kind of what what's the outlook for someone who's had such a significant injury history yeah so here's the significant injury that injury history that george is mentioning uh darren waller since 2021 has been on the injury report with a a knee or a back issue i want to say it was 12 times and then he had the hamstring last year there are a couple things that you need to consider with darren waller when it comes to his history the back issue that's low back issue we presume is not going away that would make sense with some of the you know, associated nerve stuff that he's talking about, probably the sciatic nerve stuff that he's talking about. Unfortunately, that's chronic. The other thing you have when you have a severe hamstring strain like Darren Waller has, you worry about scar tissue. You worry about some of the residual effects from your brain sensing, you know, stress or or trauma from an an old injury that sometimes just doesn't go away. You can get nerve symptoms, burning, uh, 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 sometimes tingling, honestly, like to put it frankly, sometimes your butt cheek feels like it's tingling. Um, it's really strange, right? Those sensations, I'm sure a lot of people have had them. So that's probably some of the things that Darren Waller is dealing with. Uh, and with that low back history, with the hamstring history, uh, with, with everything that we know about him and being thir- him being 31 years old, him being a big boy, right? Like he's a big frame. Yeah. It's just hard for me to really imagine him staying healthy. Now, is it possible that he's saying that he could stay healthy? Yeah, absolutely. Is this something to panic about? Like, is this a new fresh injury? No, it's not that scary. It's not It's not really on the level of like a, a Deontay Johnson or Christian Watson, a Jerry Judy. It's not, it's not a scary injury in that way. It's more of a chronic outlook of how is he going to hold up, especially since we know he's going to get a ton of targets, get a ton of usage. How is his workloads are going to spike, right? So how can he hold up? How can Darren Waller hold up? You have two options, in my opinion. You can hold Darren Waller, you can accept the risk, and you can say, yeah, I know that he's risky, but I'm going to stick for those points. I'm going to chase those points. And if he goes down, I'll just stream stream the tight end position like everybody else. Uh, Or you can get him now. I'd be interested to see, hey, Darren Waller, for we just mentioned him, for Zay Flowers. I like Zay Flowers. I think he's going to be fine. Uh, At least we know that Zay Flowers, more than likely, barring crazy circumstances, will probably stay healthy. At least I get a wide receiver 2-3 out of Zay Flowers instead of a, you know, four games of Darren Waller where he's a top five tight end. Like those are your two options. You hold him or you trade him before his value could potentially take a dip. I, I would hold him. 
I, w- I would hold them and just uh, take my chances, but I would go and grab, uh, you know, maybe one of the young r- tight ends like a Luke Musgrave or Sam Laporta or Dalton Kincaid, somebody like that. That's on the, that that's on the, uh, that could be on the waiver wire right now because uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want the upside that that Darren Waller can give because he was drafted at a point where if he if he performs up to his level, he way perf- outperforms his ADP. But uh, but yeah, you know, I, I we've I've said it before on this podcast, other places, best available, best ability is availability. So uh, and if he's not available, it's uh, not helping, but at least have a backup plan. Oh, uh, mi amigo. Uh, okay, we went a little over. We 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 started off with the with with fun stuff. Uh, let's uh, let, let's plug that Patreon una vez más. Yeah, if you go to my Twitter, uh, it's the pin tweet. It's and or honestly, you can just put it into your browser. Uh, it's it's Patreon slash injury prone. I'm pretty sure. Let me do it myself so that I know. Patreon, very professional here. Slash injury prone, and it should pop up. And there it is. Yeah, it's www. Remember when everybody used to start. Every website, like commercials, at www. I don't think they do that anymore. But it's patreoncom slash injury prone. Uh, you'll run right into it. Uh, that is exactly where you can find all of these conversations that are going to be continue. That community starting to grow. We're going to continue to have these conversations all week long. You can get Tuesday updates, Wednesday updates, Thursday updates. If you want to know what to do with your, you know, your lineup on Wednesday afternoon, we got you. We'll help you out in that space. Make sure you follow it. Uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Jorge Martin Seventeen. I am at FB Injury Doc. Mexican candy of the week. Jorge, do you have one? Because if you don't, I have one. Uh, I don't have candy, but chocomil. Oh, is my, slam dunk. Uh, Abuelita yes. chocomil? Oh, absolutely. Oh, oh absolutely. absolutely. That, absolutely. I love that. That's a good oh, one to end on. I really like that. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't know about that Abuelita chocomil, go, if you don't know, now you know. We told you. Go find your, your local carniceria, panaderia, your Mexican store, your bodega, whatever you can. Go get you some Abuelita chocomil. I'll put I'll put I'll put a picture on Twitter so someday so you can look at it, familia. Oh my good. Hey, you know what? Mañana, Mexican Independence Day. What what tequila are we uh toasting Mexico with? Oh, I love Fortaleza, but that's really hard to find. Ooh. Cimarron. If you can get a cimarron, that's a good. Um for our for our English speakers, that is Cimarron tequila or Fortaleza tequila. Ah, both both solid ones. I mean, every once in a while I find a 19, uh, 1942 uh, with 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 some amigos, but I got a bottle of Centenario that uh, that I'm slowly working through. That I'll I'll I'm, I'll have a little bit on, you know, that I'm going to be sipping tomorrow. So absolutely, salud, salud a Mexico, salud arriba Mexico. So, my amigo, let's uh, close up shop. Okay, you can find him at FB Injury Doc. You can find me at Jorge Martin Seventeen. And again, one more plug for. Uh, for the show on YouTube, go to injury prone on YouTube. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, get us over hundred. And cause I want, I want to see us way past hundred by the end of this season. Muchas gracias for joining us otra vez arriba Mexico and just uh, get ready for week two. Salud.